Welcome to AP United States History. I'm your host, Mr. Burns, and I'm so excited to be here with you on this wonderful March the 19th. And what a great day it is for us to come in and learn. Now, I'm recording this on the 19th, but I'm hoping that you guys are watching it here on the 20th. My idea is to give you guys a day break in between these videos, as I know there's a lot of content that we cover with them. Hopefully, this is beneficial to you. Uh, if any of you guys have any ideas that you think might help out the rest of us, please be sure to message me on GroupMe. I'd be happy to hear you out and implement anything that, one, is feasible for me to do, and then, two, is beneficial for all of you. Remember, all this stuff is just optional. This is just supposed to be helping you out for your AP exam. Maybe my auditory uh, learners and things like that are getting some benefit. And for all you visual and kinesthetic guys, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, all that you get to look at is my beautiful face and some images that I'm going to put up on the screen. For all of you guys that like hands-on, I have plenty of work for you. Uh, just be sure to reach out if you're struggling. Uh, today's video is going to be covering essentially what's labeled as the Eisenhower years in your AMSCO text. We're starting on page 593. All that this is going to be doing is looking to essentially supplement the reading that you've already completed. So if you haven't read through the AMSCO, be sure that you do. Um, again, the AMSCO is just a bulled down version of American history, and I'm just bulling down the bulled down version speaking with you here today. So there's plenty of stuff left here. There's plenty of topics that I'm not going to hit. Again, this is a survey course just here to help you out. With all that being said, let's go ahead and get to our first section. One small fix that I need to add is uh, we actually start at page uh, 579. We end at 593. Uh, Mr. Burns is just already looking forward to the end of this. Uh, that way he can get back to his previous uh, totally important history research, aka definitely not watching TikToks about Animal Crossing getting ready for this release tonight. Um, again, we are starting here. We're discussing President Eisenhower. Uh, what you need to know about President Eisenhower is that whenever he was elected in, essentially he's going to be bringing about what's known as modern republicanism. So the Republican Party that we think of today, Eisenhower is essentially is credited uh, for bringing about the basis of the Republican Party. Uh, these conservative ideals that he's going to be pushing forward is uh, pretty uh, dramatically different uh, than the progressive ideas that we saw from the years before. The American people were tired of the progressive ideals that had been pushed forward. They were tired of the warfare that America had found itself in with the Korean War. They were looking to push forward and trying to get rid of political scandal that had been plaguing uh, the Truman presidency uh, during his last term. And so we're going to see that Eisenhower is essentially pushing forward this idea. He's promising to get America out of Korea. He's promising to clean up the swamp, as President Trump might put it, or as he would call it, the mess in Washington. And so we still hear this rhetoric, rhetoric that we've heard previously uh, in our modern history right here during this time period as modern republicanism is establishing itself. It's notable for us to go ahead and recognize that Eisenhower was elected in after Truman, uh, and his VP was none other than Richard Nixon. Uh, Richard Nixon's going to have a little bit of a flop himself, uh, getting into some campaign financing troubles, um, but he's going to be making a comeback later on. Uh, getting back to President Eisenhower, we're going to see that one of his major focuses is going to be uh, finding a balance to the American budget. Uh, the American budget had been spending in a excess of what it was planning on bringing in. Uh, this is called deficit spending. Uh, and we're going to see that these New Deal programs that were being brought about during this time trying to kind of reinvigorate the American people is exactly why there was, in fact, that deficit. So Eisenhower's number one focus was to bring down governmental spending. He didn't cut all the New Deal policies. He actually expands on some of them, like Social Security. Uh, but his number one responsibility whenever it comes to the economic factors was to making sure that America was only spending money that it had in the bank to spend. He's also going to push forward this idea of bringing about an interstate highway system, recognizing that the modern world needed uh, modern solutions. <laughs> uh, he wanted to make sure that all the major cities within inside of the United States were interconnected through this interstate system. 
Uh, he thought that it would assist in the mobilization of troops if some kind of need did arise. Uh, with, again, this being the years of the Cold War, the Soviets are ever looming, the communists are looking to spread, or at least that was the common thought in America. Uh, it's also going to lead to an increased tax on American citizens, uh, essentially a justification uh, for that, uh, for the road systems and individuals being able to use it. So there's going to be some increased tax during this time. However, there's economic prosperity here in the onset of the uh, early 19... I said early, I should say the mid-1950s. Um, he's actually going to end up re-elected, uh, even after he suffered through a heart attack, Eisenhower and Nixon receives their re-election, uh, and essentially we've kind of taken a look at the domestic policies that Eisenhower has had. We have saw his political successes in his first election, and then his following up his second term, uh, him and Nixon going ahead and securing that spot. And so we're going to turn our attention over to the international policies, uh, specifically looking at how Eisenhower responded to the Cold War issues uh, during this time. As we've already covered, the Cold War is going to be recognized as a time period of essentially a military buildup in between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, President Eisenhower, being a previous war general, is going to be pretty confident in the capabilities that the United States has. Him and his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, is going to utilize what's known as today as Dulles Diplomacy. Essentially, whenever it comes to Dulles Diplomacy, it all centered around a concept known as brinkmanship. Um, essentially, Eisenhower and Dulles was under the impression that America could bring the Soviets to the brink of war and they would have to back down as America had a far superior nuclear store or at least that's what they thought. So America was kind of gambling during this time period specifically with Dulles calling for uh, like Taiwan to kind of push back against the communist regime and looking for America to assist them in that effort. He wanted America to essentially challenge the Soviets and also uh, China during this time period. And Dulles strong, strongly argued against America continuing on with this facade of uh, not appeasement, but instead containment, and wanting America to act in a more proactive fashion against the entrance of the Soviets and other communist states. Here in the 1950s, we see continued unrest around the world. Previous colonial states are pushing back against their colonizers and trying to assert their own independence during this time period. We're going to see Britain, France, and the Netherlands all losing hold on essentially like their African and their Asian empires. Um, these countries, again, asserting themselves as their own independent nations, uh, pushing back against the hold that these colonial powers did have. Uh, during this time period, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. It's kind of frowned upon. Uh, the era of colonialism is coming to an end, and we see that many of these uh, states, after you know uh, World War II, all of these allies were calling for self-determination. Well, their colonies were listening, and they're trying to utilize that right now uh, here in the 1950s. During this time, Eisenhower is going to be very busy utilizing the CIA to the best of its effects, uh, getting involved in the internal policies of Iran, seeing to their government being overthrown, and also in Guatemala. Uh, Eisenhower is taking, again, a very active role on the national stage uh, as we see these international policies and plans being brought about during here in the 1950s. Underneath the Eisenhower presidency, we're going to see the Korean armistice uh, come into effect. Uh, though Truman was essentially the commander on deck for that es the escapade, uh, we see that he's going to be gone by the time that everything's wrapped up and finalized. Uh, we've already talked about the North Korean, uh, South Korean divide, so if you missed it, be sure to go back and check out the last video. I know that it's 53 minutes long, but it's 53 minutes of quality content. Um, Eisenhower is going to see some other issues here inside of Asia, though, such as the fall of Indochina. Indochina was one large conglomerate uh, that France held as a colony. 
Uh, we're going to see that Japan had invaded and taken over Indochina, and after World War II, France had reasserted itself as the colonial power in charge of it. During this time period, again, self-determination being such a large factor, we see that many individuals are pushing for independence inside of this Indochina uh, colony. They're going to receive it, and we're going to have the creation of three separate countries. Those being Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam is an interesting story, uh, as you can see on the screen, as two governments are going to form inside of Vietnam, uh, one being backed by the communist, a communist regime, and the other one, a democratic regime, going to be backed by the United States. As we already said, Eisenhower is pushing forward this idea of standing up against the communists and their spread, not only trying to contain them, but even actively acting against them. Uh, we're going to see that during this time period, we have the stage set for what's going to be known as the Vietnam War, that we're going to get into more detail in a later video. We're going to see that the North Vietnam people are going to come underneath the leadership of the communist Ho Chi Minh. And then South Vietnam is going to be underneath the leadership of... <laughs> I can't say it, but uh, Google can. Here, let's listen again. That was perfect. Thank you so much, Google. Um, during this time period, both of these powers are going to divide themselves along what's known as the 17th Parallel. And we're going to have uh, essentially American support coming in to support South Vietnam, um, upwards of about a billion dollars in military and economic assistance. Just trying to make sure that that democratic power can stand up against the communist powers of North Korea. Eisenhower is going to make the argument that if South Vietnam falls to communism, then the other surrounding countries in the area would also fall. Uh, kind of like he utilized the analogy of a set of dominoes. And so this concept known as the domino theory is going to come about and it's going to become pretty famous as being a piece of essentially American propaganda pushing against the idea that any power should fall underneath communism and that's the reason why America should push back against communism in any way that they can. Alongside the monetary support, we're also going to see Dole's coming in during this time period, uh, and he wants to put into effect something known as the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or CEDO, uh, which was essentially an agreement that was signed saying that the U.S., Great Britain, France, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Thailand, and Pakistan would all work together to make sure that communism would not spread inside of this area. Again, we're talking about Southeast Asia. But things aren't just spicing up here inside of Asia, though. Not only is America working to stop the spread of communism inside of what was traditional Europe, also in Asia, but they're also working inside of an area known as the Middle East. And we're going to take a look at specifically how President Eisenhower had a lasting impact in American relations with individuals over in the Middle East. Though the Middle East might be remembered as being the cradle of civilization, we're going to see that there are a lot of crises that occur here during uh, the 1950s. And really, it's just going to be a downhill from here, guys, as we move past this effect of World War II. Uh, by 1948, uh, two essentially warring factions inside of the country of Palestine uh, had come to a, essentially an agreement, a stalemate. Um, these two warring factions were the Palestinians and the Israelis, uh, two ethnic groups that were all inside of this one country. Essentially, the Israelis made their own country. They took land and they claimed it as their own, known as Israel. Uh, they are going to be surrounded by the Palestinians, and also Egypt, uh, which is kind of a build-up to one of this major or to this major crisis during this time, known as the Suez Crisis. So essentially, we're going to have uh, the Egyptians who are upset with the Israel Israelis being established as a country. Uh, they're in support of the Palestinians and Palestine, and. America is in support of, again, self-determination on the way. They want Israel to establish itself as a country as long as the, that's what the people want. 
So America's backing Israel, uh, Egypt's backing Palestine, and we see that Egypt's in need of some major funding. And it's looking to build a large uh, dam. So it asks America first, like, hey, buddy, can we have a loan? America's like, well, actually, Egypt, I'm not going to give you all that money to go build a dam because you're trying to support the Palestinians and you're kind of causing some trouble for the Isra or for the Israelis. Uh, we're going to see that after this, Egypt's going to turn and ask the Soviet Union for help building the dam that they wanted to build, uh, and they actually get the funding. Uh, Egypt's still short, so it's actually going to go and take over uh, some British and French-owned uh, area known as the Suez Canal. This was the canal that established essentially the trade line in between Europe and the rest of the Middle East. And so Egypt acting in a hostile fashion, going and taking this over and essentially telling Britain and France that Nana Boo Boo, you can't get in here anymore. It was kind of like if I went down the road to wherever you live and set up a roadblock and I didn't let you go to like your favorite establishment like uh, Popeye's Chicken. Uh, no, you guys are tenders people. You go eat at tenders. Uh, regardless, we're going to see that Britain and France aren't going to take this lane down. They're actually going to launch a surprise attack with the assistance of uh, Israel against Egypt and reconquer this land. It's a whole debacle where Eisenhower is upset with France and Britain for not telling him about their major plan. And we see the UN condemn their actions. They end up pulling themselves out from this area. But it's going to cause some hostilities that are going to be remembered down the line. Because Eisenhower isn't okay with the Soviet Union becoming such great buddy buddies with Egypt, uh, aka one of the major roadways, pathways that Suez Canal uh, owners, we're actually going to see that Eisenhower enacts what's known as the Eisenhower Doctrine. This was essentially a agenda in which uh, Eisenhower pledged to not only commit economic assistance, but also military aid to any nation that needed it as long as they were in the Middle East and they were fighting against communism. We see Lebanon actually utilize this, uh, Eisenhower sending 14,000 Marines to go assist Lebanon during one of their crises. And so America is becoming very involved in the Middle East during this time period. These Middle Eastern countries aren't okay with America becoming so involved, and so we're going to see that in 1960, this is going to be Eisenhower's last year in office, that Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, Iran, and Venezuela, Venezuela, hold on, hold on, I got something for this, Venezuela, are all going to join up into one super organization known as the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries. These guys essentially had a monopoly on the oil supply, a resource that was growing in use here during the 1950s, and it's going to be very, very valuable moving forward in not only American history, but whenever we're looking at the global issues um, that the United States finds itself in. The communist leader Stalin is going to die in 1953. Uh, shifting back to our continuing on with our issues of the Cold War during this time, uh, we see that Eisenhower is going to call for the Atoms for Peace plan, uh, wanting to slow down the arms race that was going on in between the U.S. and also the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union's new leader is going to be uh, tentatively okay with this idea. Uh, President Eisenhower was so bold as to ask for the open sky policy, meaning that spy planes would just be allowed to fly over each other's countries and take pictures, uh, trying to dissuade any, like, surprise attacks. Uh, we see that Russia, or the Soviet Union, I should say, isn't so keen on this idea here at the start. However, the idea, the concept that America and maybe these communist countries could get along really starts to become popular or kind of begins here in 1953. We're going to see that essentially uh, the Warsaw Pact and the Communist Security uh, Organization is going to kind of come to terms with the idea of coexisting with the United States and other democratic countries to a certain extent. It's not all the way. Everything isn't all peaches, uh, but we at least see some forward movements here during Eisenhower's presidency. Hey, speaking of uh, Russia and the Cold War, how many of you guys like NASA? 
I mean, hey, it's right down the street from all of you. You've all been to space camp, all that. The image that you see on your screen is the whole reason why NASA came about. It's a satellite known as Sputnik 1. The Soviet Union would launch Sputnik up into the Earth's uh, orbit, and we're going to see that America responds by trying to launch their own satellites to kind of compete with the Russians during this time. Um, their ability to launch these satellites fail miserably, and so America's kind of embarrassed by the public. The same missiles that Russia had utilized to send these satellites up into orbit could also be utilized to deliver atomic bombs. And so, America was kind of left without a defense against the superior technology of the Russians here at what was 1957. America's public education system really hit, got hit with the brunt of the blame for this. Uh, there was a renewed interest and in even economic support for both the study of math and sciences. And that same idea is still utilized today with the many STEM programs that we find rich with inside of most American public schools uh, curriculum. During this time period, we're also going to see uh, essentially emboldened by the fact that they were able to launch these satellites and America couldn't respond that the Soviet Union is going to call for all of the West, the, the Western countries of Europe, to remove themselves uh, from uh, the East Germany. Uh, he's going to essentially say that uh, they need to remove themselves before there's an issue. They, he gives everyone a six-month time period. President Eisenhower invites the Soviets over to what's known as Camp David. It's a presidential retreat that we still use even today. Um, he meets with the Soviets, and he talks the Soviets down, and everyone's kind of okay. Uh, essentially, a pen was put in it, and everyone agreed to meet in Paris in a little while uh, to discuss the issue further, hopefully getting America uh, out of Germany and um, over on the western side. They're thinking that they just want to combine Germany back together without all the communism. Um uh, this wasn't going to happen, though, as two weeks before that meeting in Paris, a U.S. spy plane, known as a U-2, was going to be shot down over the Soviet Union. If you guys will think back to it, America had wanted to have open skies in between the U.S. and Russia, and whenever the Soviet Union didn't agree to this, President Eisenhower went ahead and greenlit the operations anyways, calling for spy planes to be utilized. Russia's going to act all bothered by that. Even though that they're utilizing spies over inside of America during this time, they're going to get on their moral high horse and they're going to denounce the United States and refuse to come to that meeting. Um, also alarmingly, during this time period, we see that uh, Cuba would become communist uh, during this time period. Um, this was kind of a shock to America as communism was so close to its uh, back door, if you will, uh, down there in the Gulf of Mexico. With Cuba literally only being 90 miles from the coast of Florida, we're going to see Eisenhower take in refugees that were fleeing from uh the new leader, Fidel Castro, from Cuba. He's going to have the American military train these exiles up. Um, he's going with the intention of them returning back to Cuba and overtaking Fidel Castro and returning their nation back to a democratic nation. Um, but Eisenhower is going to ultimately leave that decision to the next president. Uh, thanks to our utilization of our AMSCO text, we know that that next president is going to be President Kennedy. Um, Eisenhower is going to be leaving the, uh, his office right here as we get to the 1960s. Uh, he's going to be remembered as being a pretty substantial president. He's going to be uh, stemming the flow of communism throughout the international community. He's very involved, very engaged, and we see America pretty much meddling in a lot of different pies during this time period. Uh, all throughout this international politics of the time. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that that's good, I'm not trying to tell you that's bad, but what I need you to remember is that President Eisenhower brought American involvement uh, on a whole new level. Corresponding with this time of essentially like international involvement, America being very heavily involved throughout all of the um, goings on of not only like over in Asia and Africa, but also in the Middle East. 
we have a lot of changes occurring in the domestic policies of the US. If we think back, we have like Jackie Robinson, who's on the screen with you right here, who began playing professional baseball in 1947, the first African American to do so from since the 1880s. He's going to be playing on the field with other white players. A uh, big shakeup, as segregation was very prominent during the time. You also have, of course, President Truman, who had integrated the armed forces in 1948, uh, not allowing segregation to continue. You really have a push for the civil rights movement here during this time period, as we see that there was a, pretty much a change in regards to how uh, African Americans were organizing themselves. Many of them had fled to the urban centers of both the North and the South, and so they're calling for changes in large numbers during this time period. You also have a essentially a glaring issue. America is supposed to be the land of the free, home of the brave. America wants democracy to be appealing. However, it lives in a system in which there's blatant class division uh, through segregation. And so communism is supposed to be a uniting belief. It brings everyone to the same level. Everyone gets the same stuff, supposedly. And so essentially America had to confront the large issue of that it was leading a double life during this time period. One of the major advancements that we see here is going to be in the 1950s with the Brown versus Board of Education uh, judgment. Essentially, the idea was that the concept of separate but equal was thrown out through the court system, meaning that America had to reintegrate its schools, allowing for African Americans to return back to the classroom with whites. In response to this Brown versus Board of Education, you had 101 members of Congress signing what was known as the Southern Manifesto, condemning the Supreme Court for coming up to a clear abuse of judicial power, as they put it, by forcing the states to allow blacks to go to the same school as whites. As you can see on the screen here, not a lot of people were very happy with this idea. Things got so bad whenever people were just trying to follow the law in 1956 in Arkansas that the governor literally had to call the National Guard to protect uh, African American children as they were trying to make their way to Central High School. These nine children that were just trying to follow the law, go to school where their districts lined up, would become known as the Little Rock Nine. They would face crowds every day that they tried to go into school of grown adults yelling at them racial slurs, telling them that they're, they're nothing, all because they were just doing what they were told to do, which is to go to school. Something that we all know sucks already, why in the world would you make it even worse? This next image should be pretty familiar to you. This lady is uh, pretty infamous, uh, this being Rosa Parks. In 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, pretty close to home, we're actually going to have Rosa Parks refuse to give up her seat whenever another white passenger makes his way onto the bus, uh, as was dictated by the segregation laws of the time. Uh, black uh, riders were supposed to give up their seat to white riders whenever there were no other seats available. Rosa Parks is going to refuse. She's going to be arrested. And we're going to see civil rights leaders center around her and her case, uh, hopefully building a, a anti-discrimination policy inside of the state of Alabama as well. You're going to have the young leader Martin Luther King Jr. really make his name in what would become known as the Montgomery Bus Boycott as the African American community would uh, speak out and act out against the racist policies of Montgomery, Alabama in probably one of the best ways, in a peaceful way, uh, directly tied into other people's pocketbooks. You see, that was the way of Martin Luther King. This young leader here at this time advocated for peaceful protest, uh, nonviolent protest, uh, centered around the concept of civil disobedience. Martin Luther King had learned from one of the best, Gandhi, and saw that as long as you were breaking a law because you felt that it was morally incorrect, uh, that, hey, suffer through the consequences, but maybe if enough of you guys do it, that there will be some actual change centered around it. 
Now we're going to have a deep dive in regards to the civil rights movement. Uh, so don't worry, I'm not skimping out on you. That's all that your AMSCO covers. Uh, but we're going to get into uh, a lot more detail. But here we are on page 590 talking about pop culture in the 50s uh, with this legend on screen, none other than Elvis Presley. Now Mr. Burns has an affinity for Elvis. Uh, my grandpa loved the guy, always played his records. Whenever it came to Mr. Burns having to buy like Christmas presents and stuff, it was an easy night because all I had to do was go get my papa something Elvis and he would love it. So during this time period, we're going to have the advent of what's known as rock and roll. Now, I know that I sound like an old geezer, okay, boomer, whenever I'm sitting here talking about this to you, but we have here in the 1950s some new radical sounds coming out, uh, something that's going to be built on and continued as we progress forward inside of American history. Elvis Presley is going to become the face of rock and roll during this time. You also have television, which is becoming more and more popular. Shows like I Love Lucy uh, taking off during this time period. Uh, uh, the advent of TV dinners and things like that occur here in the 1950s. Uh, advertising is going to take off. If we thought that American consumerism was big in the 1920s, guys, it skyrockets here. You have commercials. You have radio ads. It's just a, a seller's... No... That's not the right word. And advertisers dream during this time period as they're able to come up with all of these new ways to put products in American consumers' faces. Uh, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise, but Americans have been reading back since 1776, and paperback novels are going to be a new way that Americans are able to consume written media. I know that none of you guys read anymore for fun, but here during this time period, paperback novels are actually pretty in. I'm totally joking. I know that some of you guys read, and I appreciate that. I'm sorry. I just had to say it. The idea of corporate America also grows during this time. Uh, we're going to have many CEOs taking off and really pushing for American uh, business investments. Uh, it's this time period where we see the idea of shareholders being the top dogs, being the top priority, really push forward. Uh, big companies are going to be all working together. These white-collar jobs are going to become pretty much the American norm as we even see it here inside of 2020. Also during this time period, we're going to see um, if our last section was talking about the baby boom. Here we have the working women. Um, women during this time period are still traditionally thought of as being homemakers. This idea of the modern Republican Party coming about uh, brought with it those same concepts of Republican motherhood that we saw way back in the 1700s. However, we do have more and more women during this time period, more women than previously, out inside of the job field. It should be noted that most women would fulfill like clerical work, as we can see on our screen. This would be a secretary uh, taking a note or a memo for someone. Um, during this time period, we see more and more ladies involved inside of our working spaces. Um, also, ladies are not going to be paid as much as most men employers saw these women as performing less important jobs, less important roles, uh, not deeming them worthy enough to make the same money uh, as their male counterparts. Now, as you can imagine, that would probably upset some people, and there were plenty of other people that were upset in the 1950s. Uh, such as the Beat Generation. Uh, the Beat Generation, are also referred to as Beatniks, are going to be a group of essentially rebellious writers and intellectuals uh, that kind of ran as a counterculture to this predominant pop culture of the 1950s. Um, you have influential individuals such as Allen Ginsberg writing his infamous Howl in 1956. Uh, these guys are going to be pushing for some pretty crazy things, such as the use of drugs, rebellious, rebellion against social standards. Uh, now, of course, I know that you guys would never rebel against social standards, 
Uh, but whenever you do, I want you to think back to the beat generation, the beatniks, as these guys are going to become essentially the models for like the greasers and the other tropes of like anti or, uh, anti-cultures that are going to come, uh, the punk rock movement that's going to be coming a little bit later on. All of them kind of have their roots back here with these beatniks during the time. Alright guys, that's been our discussion of chapter 27. He just got up here too. Uh, I hope that it was beneficial. Uh, that was my little buddy Leo. Um, he just can never make up his mind. He's not as friendly as Percy. Um, that was our discussion in Chapter 27. I hope that you found it beneficial. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, be sure to message me over on GroupMe. You guys know that I'm always watching. If anything comes up, please let me know. Uh, and if you have any ideas about what it is that you would like to do, what you would find beneficial at the house while we're all hanging out, enjoying our coronaviruses, please let me know. All right, guys. I'm Mr. Burns, and it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to see you guys next week.